Welcome, welcome, welcome to the latest episode of Outdoor Photography Guide brought to you by our sponsor, Tamron. And we've got an exciting episode today. We always have an exciting episode, don't we, Lilia? We do, always very exciting. Yes. Well, uh, just by way of introduction, I'm professional photographer Ian Plant. And I am Lilia Khalif. And we are here with Outdoor Photography Guide Live, where I'm going to share with you some of my latest photo adventures and plenty of tips and techniques about outdoor photography and answer viewer questions. So if you've got some questions that you're just burning to have answered by a professional photographer, feel free to leave them in the comment section of the, the page that we currently have open for the chat here. And we'll try to get to as many questions as we can later on. Anything you want to add about that, Lilia? Um, I don't think so, but just make sure you scroll under the video and it's a box that's outlined in blue and you have to sign into the chat and put your question in there. Not in the comments below, but in the chat box right under the video. All right, fantastic. I just uh, recently got back from a trip up into the Canadian Rockies. Uh, I was there ostensibly to do some photography, but I was also maybe doing a little Bigfoot hunting as well. Oh. Yes, I'm, a, I'm actually, I don't believe in Bigfoot. Did you get any photos of Bigfoot? <laughs> No, but all I got was this t-shirt. Well, there you go. Yeah, yeah. I'm not a, I, I don't believe in Bigfoot. I'm a, I'm a big fan, however, of people who do believe in Bigfoot. You're a fan of the people. Yes, so, okay. exactly. Uh, but I was up there in the height of winter. It was very cold when I was there, and I was there for about two weeks doing photography. And I actually had a pretty rough trip. It, uh, it wasn't the, the most it wasn't the best weather for doing landscape photography. Ideally, what you really want for great landscape photos is to have lots of clouds in the sky at sunrise or sunset, but you want the area right above where the sun is rising or right below where the sun is setting, uh, you want that to be clear because if you get those conditions, that means at sunrise and sunset, you can get really amazing, spectacular, colorful skies. And those skies, having all those clouds light up with color at sunrise and sunset are really critical to getting stunning landscape photo uh, photographs. Unfortunately, I got the opposite for the most part. If there were clouds, they were always hanging out on the horizon, and they were always blocking the sun at sunrise or sunset. Mm -hmm. And quite often, I didn't have any clouds that were higher up. So without those high clouds, you really don't get those spectacular sunrises and sunsets. And if you've got low clouds that are blocking the light, when you get to those golden hours, those times when the sun is most colorful, then that's not a very good recipe for making uh, successful landscape photos. So this trip and the images I'm going to share with you in this first part of the live event today is more a lesson in what not to do rather than <laughs> what to do. And actually, I was so unsuccessful with the photographs that I had to combine the photographs I'm showing you today with some other photographs I've taken from previous okay. trips to the Canadian Rockies, which were also bad in terms of the weather. <laughs> the Rockies so. were just not fond of you either time you went. Huh? I have, yeah, I've been up there three times to photograph, and I've never, ever had good light the whole time I was there. So I had to combine my very mediocre shots from previous trips with the mediocre shots I got from this trip to give you a mediocre lesson in landscape photography. All right. Yeah, so I'm going to dive right <laughs> into that. Uh, I, if, if there's, you know, I'm many things, but honest with myself is, uh, is the most important thing. Right. So these are not great photos. I'm going to talk about more what it is I was hoping to do with these photos and what would have taken them over the top to the next level. And uh, they're not really going to be demonstrating anything that's particularly good. You know, when you don't get the light, it, it's really difficult to make things happen. Yeah. And you can even scout out some interesting compositions. But the compositions are always incomplete until you get the clouds in the sky. And if you don't get the right clouds, you don't get the right color, you're never really finding a way to maximize the potential of a landscape scene. So I was able, I was able to come up with a few compositions that I kind of like. So let's go to the first image. We're going to go to the iPad so I can do some drawing and stuff like that. So here's an example of a composition that I think could have been really interesting if I had the right uh, clouds in the sky and if I had some good color. But unfortunately, it was at sunset. There was only some very, very faint and hazy light on the mountains. The sun was being blocked by a lot of clouds. So I never really got that golden light on the mountains. And I never had the right clouds coming in to bring this composition together. So it's actually not a bad composition. There are many things about it that I like. Um, hold on a second. Let me go into edit. And then we will go ahead and do some drawing on this. I think it's the um, dot, dot, dot. There we yep, go. There the dot, go. dot, dot. We're going to mark that up. I had to think up. about it, too. I couldn't quite remember. Yes. It's been a while. I'm going to pick a color. So in terms of the composition, uh, I think it's a good idea with your landscape photographs 
to have some sort of foreground element. And this allows you to create depth and visual progression in your photograph. So here I've got this snow bank as the foreground. I've got some open water uh, that's the next visual element in the progression of visual elements. And then I've got this curving band of ice. That's another visual element. So we're working our way up from the bottom of the composition to the top. We've got the reflection of the mountains. We've got some stuff that's in the middle ground here, some of the trees in the snowbank. You've got the mountain in the background. And then you've got the sky above that. So this creates a layered composition, a visual progression from near to far. This gives the viewer a sense of depth and also a sense of being there. And it invites them visually into the photograph. So going for this multi-layered approach, working with near elements at the foreground, leading to a stunning scenic feature in the background can be a very effective way to build a really nice landscape composition. But here it didn't quite work out because of the, the bad light. Uh, hold on a second, there we go. Get rid of some of these things. So if this had stronger light, I think this would have been much more effective. Also, if there had been some interesting clouds, the clouds would have been that extra layer. So let's mm. say we had some really interesting clouds up there. Is that a drawing of a cloud? <laughs> <laughs> uh, that, that is my artistic rendition of what good clouds would look oh. like. Yeah, there's a reason why I became a photographer, not a drawer. Uh, so um, if I had some clouds in the sky, they would have kind of completed the visual progression and they would have injected some much needed color into this photograph. So this is a photograph that didn't quite work out. I did like the composition. I tried this many different times. I never was successful with it because the light never worked out for me. And that happens a lot with landscape photography. What I do is I go out and I find the interesting compositions and then I wait for the light to be right. And sometimes it works out and sometimes I go back over and over again and it never does work out. But I'm constantly scouting and exploring, trying to find interesting compositions, and then trying to find even better compositions so that I've got a variety of options that I can play with. And I can go to a spot, depending on how the light is working, how the clouds are working, and pick the composition that's going to work best with the, uh, the light and the clouds that I have. And when I was in the Rockies, I spent a lot of time looking for interesting foregrounds. Now, it was cold up there, so almost everything was frozen, and most of the ice was covered with snow. And those aren't very interesting foregrounds. So I spent a lot of time looking for open water and interesting uh, ice patterns. And unfortunately, there were only a very few spots that I could get to that had those characteristics. So I spent a lot of time looking and I found a few spots, you know, maybe five or 10 spots that looked like they had promise. A few looked good for sunrise, a few looked good for sunset. And then I just kept going back over and over again to these same spots with my fingers crossed, hoping that I get some good light. So going back into the photos, um, we will go ahead and take a look at, um, this is a photo that I actually took a few years ago during my first winter trip to the Canadian Rockies. And we'll go into the edit function. Once again, you can see that we've got this foreground using the patterns of the ice that was forming on the river. And be very, very careful if you're going on ice. Uh, usually in areas where there's a deep freeze, like the Canadian Rockies or here in Minneapolis, where we're based, um, a lot of times the lakes and the streams will freeze over very thickly and you'll see people driving on them <laughs> and lots of ice fishing. You know you're pretty safe walking around on those lakes. But if there's any doubt, stay close to shore. Be very, very careful. Don't do this at home, kids. This could be potentially dangerous. If you go in and you're in deep water, your body might respond very negatively to the initial shock of just falling in that cold water. And it might be difficult to get out. Hypothermia and shock can set in very quickly. So this can be extremely dangerous. So please be careful. If you have any doubts about your ability or about the condition of the ice, don't go out on open water ice. I always carry a mountaineering ice axe and I use that to probe the ice mm -hmm. to make sure that it's sufficiently thick and will support my weight. So here, I was on a stream that uh, was emptying into a frozen lake, and the ice was very thin here. There's some interesting frost patterns that had formed, and I used them as my foreground. And then there was ice here as well that was uh, maybe only about a half an inch or an inch thick. So I was on the edge of, of the, uh, the ice here, and you can see that there was actually open water back here. But I also only had about a foot of water underneath me. 
So if I did break through, I would have ended up with wet feet, <laughs> and I probably be, would have been cursing a lot, but I uh, nonetheless would not have been uh, in a really dangerous place. So I'm very cautious about this. So once again, didn't quite get the light. I got a little bit of light uh, from the rising sun on the mountain, and there were some clouds in the sky, which certainly helps make the composition more interesting, but I never really got that stunning, beautiful pink and golden sunrise light. And so the scene, although it came together okay, wasn't exactly what I was looking for. So once again, it is really critical to get the best light that you can. Now, Sunny days are typically not my favorite for landscape photography because there's no clouds. And as a result, if I'm making a composition that includes the sky, I don't find it to be very exciting if there's nothing there. But sunny days can lead to some interesting opportunities and some really strong and powerful light. So here's a telephoto shot I took. Once again, this was from a previous trip uh, to the Canadian Rockies. This past trip, I never really quite got anything you know, this sunny or this good. Um, but this had, was an area where there had been a fresh snowfall. There was lots of frost on the trees. You know, having snow covering the trees is really important for winter landscape photography. Mm -hmm. A lot of people get really excited about winter, but unfortunately, unless the snow is fresh, it often just doesn't look that good. And when it starts melting off the trees or blowing off the trees in the wind, and you've got these dark, leafless trees that are in the scene, it can be really ugly. So having that fresh snowfall on everything can be really helpful in making great winter landscape scenes. So for this particular shot, I was lucky there was lots and lots of snow that was just caked on these trees. This is actually more ice that was forming. Mm -hmm. What would happen is there was some open water here, and when it got really cold, uh, some mist would form over the uh, open water, and as that mist would move around, it would cake the trees in a layer of what's known as rime ice, or hoarfrost. And, uh, and this hoarfrost, this rime ice on the trees would build up, and it they would basically look like uh, these living statues, these frozen statues. So having that look is very critical, because if you don't have good snow on the trees, then they just don't look uh, very good at all. So here you can see some of that mist, that is in the background, and this scene was being backlit by the rising sun, so I used a telephoto lens to zoom in and just capture the most interesting, the most compelling part of the overall scene. I excluded the sky, I just got some of that backlit mist in the scene, and I, I focused in on the most interesting pattern of the, of the trees here. All right, any questions so far? Oh, I have a few questions, let's okay. see. Great. Um, the last one you mentioned, that was at sunrise or sunset, did you say? That um, last one? Which last that, one? The one with the hoarfrost. The hoarfrost was sunrise. OK, uh, well, kind of related to this, since <laughs> it's a dark one. Um, Cam Canada in the chat asks, do you do you do night photography in the winter? Uh, I do do night photography in the winter, or at least I try. Uh, night photography can, can be a great time. Uh, winter can be a great time for night photography because one of the challenges, especially when you're doing long exposures with a digital sensor, is that the sensor can warm up during very long exposures and create digital noise as a result. And in the winter, your sensor never really warms up. Uh, of course, it can be a little challenging when you're doing night photography in the winter because if it gets cold enough, then your camera can actually freeze. And I, I had this recently. I was doing some star photography on my recent trip to the Canadian Rockies, and it got pretty cold. I think it was uh, maybe about uh, 10 degrees Celsius, which is something much lower in Fahrenheit, <laughs> really cold. Yeah. And I was setting up a series of exposures that I was going to blend later to create star trails. And I think my camera lasted for about five minutes before wow. the shutter froze. And so I, you know, I went and I set everything up, set it for an hour's worth of continuous 15 second exposures. I came back after an hour and everything had been completely shut down because the shutter froze. Wow. So I missed all the shots that I was trying to get. So, uh, so yeah, night photography is a great thing to do in the winter, but just be aware that if things get really, really cold, your camera, your camera batteries might have some trouble actually doing what they're supposed to be doing. I actually have a piggyback off mm -hmm. of that question. Um, let me see, find it in here. Top Red asks, how do you handle your lenses fogging over from extreme temperature changes like in the winter? Do you have any particular tips for that? Yeah, and this is actually pretty simple. Mm -hmm. Just make sure, what happens is when you're transferring your equipment from let's say a warm uh, apartment or a warm car out into the cold, uh, really more of a problem when you're going the other way, when you're out in the cold and then you bring it into a warm environment. If you take your lenses out 
right away, they're going to fog over. Yeah. And, um, and they can sometimes fog over really, really badly. Like it might take hours for them to defog on their own. So the easiest thing you can do is just make sure that your cameras and your lenses are inside a camera bag. And whenever you transfer the equipment from a warm to a cold environment, or more importantly, vice versa, cold to warm, just give the bag uh, a little bit of time to warm up to the ambient room temperature before opening up the bag. Mm -hmm. So that'll very slowly warm up the equipment on the inside, and you shouldn't have any condensation issues then. Just let the equipment warm up. Don't take it out right away. Let it warm up for about an hour after you get uh, back to your uh, warm hotel room or warm house or warm car, and you shouldn't have any problems. I'm going to preheat time. Yes. <laughs> I, I've never had a problem going from the warmth to the cold, uh, but I have had things fog up the other way around. Oh. Yeah. All in right. The winter. So, and if your camera shutter ever freezes, whatever you do, don't open up the the camera box and poke your finger in there and try to unlodge Is the that shutter. That's what you did. That, well, <laughs> I mean, I'm dumb, but I'm, even I'm not that dumb to try that. The, the best thing just you can do. Just wondering if you were speaking from experience. Or... <laughs> the best thing you can do is just bring your camera into a warm environment, let it warm up on its own. Usually, the shutter, if it gets stuck, will unfreeze within about five or ten minutes, and you'll actually hear the camera just open up, and everything will be fine. So all right. that's all you need to do. All right. Uh, so back to the photos. So here is a photo I took on this most recent trip. Um, once again, I was looking for some interesting ice or open water, and I found some clear ice on this small stream, and I was on the bank of the stream, and I tried to use the, the snow that was covering the ice on the edge of the stream as my foreground. So I've got some, we'll go into the edit thing here. I can uh, mark this up, have a little bit of fun. Let's use the color red this time. So you can see that I'm using the curve of the shoreline as part of my composition to lead the eye in. I've got the, the bubble here. I think it was a, a boulder that was sticking out of the ice that was covered in snow. And then the path of the frozen stream itself. Uh, all these things help lead the eye from the bottom and the foreground of the image into the background scenery. So all these things work together to encourage the eye to go deeper into the scene. And then you've got the scenic mountain in the background, the trees sticking up, and uh, a nice cloud in the sky uh, to really complete that visual interest at the top of the image frame. So the viewer's eye is encouraged to travel layer upon layer from bottom to top in the, comp in the composition. So this is why clouds are so important. This is why I'm always hoping to get some interesting clouds as well as that beautiful sunrise or sunset light. So the light wasn't very strong. You can see that I only got some weak light on the mountain in the background and I didn't really get any color on the clouds. But having the clouds there really helps the overall composition and makes this, uh, whoops, let me uh, go in and get rid of some of that markup there. My apologies. That red. There we go, done. Um, so this really does help, the cloud helps bring the composition together. So this is one of those shots that was almost there. I'm not super happy about the composition. A Little bit awkward, I feel like there was a little bit too much activity on the left side. Mm -hmm. The right side of the image frame doesn't quite have as much visual energy, so I really wasn't, finding a very good way to balance this composition. I think if that, that snow-covered boulder had been a little bit more to the right, uh, that would help balance the composition a bit more. Or if that cloud had drifted in more to the right, what happened is the clouds were drifting in from the left, and then they were just basically disappearing when they got over the mountain. So they never quite moved to the right to help balance the composition, and I never got the light and the color that I wanted. So not a bad shot. I'm not completely disgusted with it, but I'm also not super <laughs> not happy about it. completely disgusted. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay, but it's not really what I was hoping for, so. Since we're talking yeah. about the photos, I have a few questions in reference to them. Um, mm -hmm. The first one, Greg asks, are you going to discuss any camera settings from any of the photos that you're showing? Oh yeah, sure, I'd be happy to. Uh, you know, usually I try to uh, talk more about the artistic stuff, mm -hmm. uh, but the camera settings are, of course, important. Um, so for most of these, I mean, the really the relevant setting for landscape photography, more often than not, is simply the aperture. Because usually most landscape scenes are pretty static. You're shooting on a tripod, so you're not shooting with high ISOs. You're typically shooting with your base ISO to enhance overall image quality. 
And you are also not usually worried about shutter speed for most landscape shots. Though if you have moving water or moving elements, then shutter speed can be important. But aperture controls the depth of field, which is how the zone of apparent sharpness spreads around your focus point and makes the parts of the image look like they're sharp or not. So usually you want to use a smaller aperture to extend your depth of field, to extend that zone of sharpness, so that everything from near to far in your composition, everything from the foreground to the background, is rendered as being sharp and focused. So for a lot of my landscape shots, I'm typically at f11 or f16 to make sure I've got all of that uh, depth of field that I need so that everything's sharp throughout the entire image frame. Now I also do a lot of what is known as focus stacking, which is taking exposures where everything is the same. The exposure or the composition is identical. You just change your focus point. And then you blend those on a computer and that enhances the depth of field and just make sure that everything looks nice and sharp in your final uh, landscape photo. So this is a technique that I've been using a lot more in the past few years uh, just because it makes everything look better in the landscape photo and everything looks much, much sharper. So it's a great technique just for enhancing that overall near-far sharpness. And all these techniques, depth of field, uh, using aperture to control depth of field, using focus stacking, they're all in, uh, described in great detail in my ebook and video, which is available on the OPG shop focusing for landscape photography. So you definitely want to check that out if you want to learn how to do all these techniques. All right, and then my other quick question mm -hmm. about the photos is, this may be very difficult to describe, so we'll see what you say, but can you share any of the general locations of these photos in the park? Uh, <laughs> Which I'd like, good luck describing that, but I thought I'd throw it out there. Yeah, so, so most of these were actually shot in, in Banff National Park in the oh. Canadian Rockies. Uh, and of course, Banff is pretty big. Uh, some of these are locations that I would find off the Icefields Parkway. Other locations are kind of spread around. Some of these are a little bit difficult to describe how to get to because yeah. it would involve me actually going into the backcountry a little bit to find a spot. And so it's a little, a little bit difficult uh, to, uh, to really pinpoint uh, where most of these aren't exactly what I would call like famous spots. Yeah. Um, so this one, for example, this is Castle Mountain. It's actually one of the, um, the more prominent landscapes there. Uh, so it's something that's a bit more familiar. It's easier to find this, this spot. Mm -hmm. But a lot of the other places are a little bit more random and a little bit uh, harder to, uh, to describe where they are and how to get there. Mm -hmm. But, and of course, it, it almost doesn't really matter because conditions are always changing when you're doing yeah. winter photography. So I was looking for open water or places where there was interesting ice that wasn't covered by snow. And really what that meant was I spent a lot of time driving around and then getting out hiking or snowshoeing around to find these things. And sometimes I would find a spot and then I'd go there the next day and it'd be completely different. It would have frozen over or there would have been a snowfall so all the good ice was covered up. So it really changes day by day. All right. Yep. Go on to the next photo. All right. Some more questions later. Fantastic. The next photo, hold on a second. I have to cancel that. Discard changes. All right, this is a shot from a few years ago, and this is probably my single most successful shot from the Canadian <laughs> Rockies. And it, I think it's actually on my website, part of my permanent portfolio, but it's really not the best landscape photo I've ever taken <laughs> far from it. Uh, it just really just is, is the best I've got from the Rockies, so I show it to people. Um, and so there's some things about this composition that I do like. So let's go into the editing suite here, and I can show you. So, uh, one thing in particular that I like is the foreground. So I found this bend in the river, there was some flowing water, and there was some newly created ice with all of the, this little hoarfrost features. So these little bits of uh, frost, I'm not gonna draw on every single one of them, but <laughs> you get not? the idea. <laughs> So it was really interesting, and I loved the V-shape that was formed by this bend in the river. So I used the, the bank of snow as my immediate foreground, and this V-shape became the basis of the foreground part of my composition. And that V is complemented by an opposite V uh, on the other side that creates this narrowing of perspective. So first the V takes the viewer's eyes out of the center of the composition, and then the other V takes the viewers back 
to the center of the composition where we have that beautiful sunrise sky and a little mountain in the background. So this creates a lot of visual tension in this composition, so it makes it more interesting. Getting the viewer's eye moving in different directions can be very effective at building visual interest in your composition. So I'm always looking for ways to get the eye zigging and zagging back and forth, uh, making the viewer's journey much more complete throughout your entire composition. So I like the overall composition, and I did get a bit of a nice sunrise. I wish I had something a bit more dramatic than this, but this was the best I've seen. And by the way, I've learned from friends in the area. After I left the Rockies, after 10, 12 days there without any luck, there was a stretch of about a week where every morning and every night there was beautiful sunrise and sunsets, guys. So it's uh, just all a matter of luck. You probably would have wished they wouldn't have told you that. <laughs> know, <laughs> probably could have gone without knowing. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, eh, maybe I should fly back there, but no, I'm convinced that I'm the one bringing in the bad weather. So I'm going to stay clear and let the locals get the great shots. <laughs> So, um, so you know, this was a nice, a nice shot. There was some elements that I liked. I liked the foreground composition. I liked the color in the sky. Could have been a little bit better. But what I don't like is that there really wasn't a prominent mountain in the background. So I had this one mountain that was very distant. It's a big mountain, but because it's so far away, it's just really not that visible in the shot. So it would have been better if I had a nice big mountain in that background. It would have been much more interesting. Uh, but you can't always get what you want. And the song says that sometimes you get what you need, but sometimes you don't get anything at all. And <laughs> that's pretty much what this trip. Now, this <laughs> next photo is actually, I think, arguably the most successful photo I had during the whole trip. It was the first morning I was there. I was supposed to be there earlier the previous day, but my flight got delayed by several hours. So I didn't show up in time to do any scouting or to get any sunset photography. So instead, I had to go there at sunrise, drive in the dark to one of the locations I had shot many, many years before, not knowing what was going to be there. And that happened to be the most beautiful light that I got on the entire trip. So I was completely unprepared to optimize that chance with that beautiful light. And so there was this great light on the mountain in the background. And there were some interesting things going on. There was some nice patterns in the ice on the stream, and I was using those patterns as my foreground. And I got very, very low. I was down to ground level on my tripod, and I did this so that I could bring the reflection of the mountains in the background and the sky above them down into the ice so I could bring more color into the foreground parts of my composition. So by getting that low, it makes depth of field really difficult. So I used focus stacking to make sure that everything was sharp from near to far in the composition. So this was the best chance I had, and I got a shot that I'm pretty happy with, but not super happy with, because I had to go to this spot sight unseen. I had no idea what to expect, and the light, really, the good light doesn't last for very long. It lasted for maybe five or 10 minutes. So I had to do all my experimenting. I had to do all of the scouting that I would have done the day before mm -hmm. if I had been there on time within those five or 10 minutes. So it was really kind of a jumbled, chaotic mess. I did the best I could. Not super happy with it, but it's the best shot I got from the trip. So it is what it is. So there you have it. That's exactly what not to do. If you are going to a photo location, make sure you do a lot of scouting. Make sure that your flight gets there on time so you don't miss out on an opportunity. But you have to spend a lot of time finding those compositions because those moments where you get really great light are often fleeting and few and far between. So you want to make sure you've picked out the very best compositions. And you've kind of worked out how to really take that composition to the, the best place you can possibly take it. So when that great light happens, you're there, you're ready, and you can bring it all together. So spend as much time as you can exploring. Really work hard to develop some great places for you to photograph. Really, really try your hardest to come up with some stunning, compelling compositions, and then cross your fingers and hope that you get great light, great weather, great clouds that can bring it all together. Get the stars to align. Yes. <laughs> all right. With that being said, I'll go into the questions that we have. So all right. keep asking questions, and we'll answer as many as we get in the time allowed. And so while you're uh, asking, I'm going to do some drinking. All right. I'll let you. I'll give you some ample time, because I got the question queued up right now. I don't want you to struggle through. All right, our first question is from, what have I not asked? Cam Canada, do you have any recommendations for best protection covers for cameras and lenses from the harsh elements? 
Okay, so the best protection you can have is insurance. Oh. Uh, <laughs> I, you know, I get this question a lot. I'm, I'm like the wrong person to ask because as a professional photographer, my view is that gear should be abused <laughs> and then discarded when it's no longer functional. So I'm, I'm usually not very good at taking care of my gear. But uh, there are a number of solutions out there. there. You can buy rain covers for your gear that help keep uh, water and uh, it's also good if you're working in uh, moist conditions. You know, so for example, the reason why my shutter froze that one particular evening I was out photographing was because I was by a stream and mm -hmm. there was some mist that was kind of floating around. And so this probably got onto the shutter and froze it over. So have, even if it's not raining out, uh, having some sort of rain gear or rain cover on your camera and lens can help from mo you know, having moisture and condensation forming on the lens and possibly getting into the electronics. So there are definitely things you can do. Uh, to protect your equipment from gear. If you're looking to protect yourself from really extreme environments, like if you're working uh, on the coast and there might be uh, uh, waves coming in that can uh, accidentally uh, get on your lens or your camera or lots of sand or anything like that, uh, there are some relatively inexpensive, inexpensive uh, camera housings that you can use. There's a company called Utex. Uh, I think it's O-U-T-E-X. And they make these, uh, these rubber camera housings that you can put over your camera. And uh, you can actually dive with them underwater, though I've, I find that they're a little tricky to get on right. So I've actually destroyed a few cameras uh, using their stuff because I didn't put it on right. So my advice is if you're really going to be doing a lot of underwater photography, get a professional housing. But the Utex housing is really great if you're working in, in wet, uh, sandy and muddy environments where there might be a lot going on and, and you're not trying to get your camera in the water or drop it in the mud, but because so much is going on, there's a possibility that that mud or that water is going to get kicked up and sprayed onto your camera lens. The Utex housing is a real great way to prevent uh, accidental immersion or a uh, wave splashing over your camera, ruining your photo shoot. All right. Our next question is from Jim, who says, I saw in an OPG video that you use flash when shooting wildlife. Mm -hmm. I never thought that that would work at far distances. Can you expand on settings and technique? How do you prevent animal red eye? Um, OK, so flash, actually, if you got a really powerful flash unit, uh, it will go very far. So some of the most powerful flash units are designed to throw a beam of light out as much as 100 or 200 feet away. And so. Uh, you actually can, with the more expensive units, light up very distant animals. Though most of the photography I've done with flash has been more close up. So I may be only 20 feet away from the lion as opposed to using the flash when it's 100 feet away. And when you have higher ISOs or you're using wide open apertures, you can actually, your, your camera is gathering more light. So that flash is effectively extended. Another thing you can do is get a flash extender. And this is a physical device that you put on front of your flash. It's a Fresnel lens that helps uh, magnify the beam of light. So it narrows the beam of light, but it throws it out a bit farther. So you can use that to extend using the flash. Now, in terms of avoiding camera red eye, so red eye is something that is uh, not necessarily going to be show up with all animals. So with humans, it's called red eye. With other animals like cats, you get green eye instead. Some animals, their eyes don't really react to it the way that a human or a cat eye might uh, react. It just depends on the animal and, and the structure of its eye. But the best way to avoid eye shine generally is to have the flash at a slight angle. If the, if the flash is basically shining right into your subject's eyes, you can get that eye shine. But if you're using something like a flash bracket, which is designed to get the flash off that, that perfect angle so that it's just a little bit off in the angle, and it hits the eye at a different angle, and that eliminates or mitigates eye shine. So that's one way to do it. All right. Our next question is from my favorite username in the chat, which is Chicken Kiev. Chicken Kiev. Yes. All right. I love Chicken Kiev. Chicken Kiev asks, <laughs> lens pen leaves dust on my UV filters. How do I deal with that? Ah, well, so dust on your filters is uh, always a bit of a challenge. Um, I, I'm actually pretty bad at keeping my lenses and my filters clean. If you were to look at my lenses, you'd be shocked at how dusty they are. It's a good idea to keep your equipment as well dusted as you possibly can. But normally, you're not going to notice. Like if you've got some dust spots on your lens or your filter, in 99.9% 99 .9 of the shooting situations, you'll never even know it's there. Uh, usually, the only time it'll really become apparent is if you're shooting into the light, shooting into the sun or shooting into a bright uh, source point of light, 
any imperfections on your lens can create lens flare. So if you've got a dusty, dirty lens or a filter and you're shooting into the light, you can get some really bad flare and it might not be what you want for your final image. So keeping that lens, keeping that filter clean is a good idea. Now a good old fashioned lens cloth is probably the best thing you can do to just keep those clean. Uh, so I have used the lens pen before and the lens pen is pretty good at getting rid of smears, but Inevitably, you're never going to be able to get all of the dust off. If you've just got a little, uh, a few flakes of dust here and there, I wouldn't worry about it because even if you do get those off, chances are within the next five or 10 seconds, another dust spot is going to find its way and stick to that filter of the lens. So the best thing you can do is to keep it mostly clean. Uh, definitely you want to clear off any smears or anything like that. That's probably more problematic. So a lens cloth and maybe a little bit of lens cleaner can be very helpful at uh, cleaning the lens. One product that I like to use, um, I think I bought this at Walmart. I bought this giant pack of these uh, Zeiss lens cleaning cloths that are designed for cleaning glasses. And I was able to buy them in like this giant box bulk, oh. like a thousand of them for, I don't know, <laughs> three bucks at Walmart. And so I think it's Zeiss. I mean, I haven't, I haven't like gone through my box at all. Yeah. But they have these basically the, the, these uh, alcohol cleaning pads that you use for eyeglasses. Mm -hmm. And they were great for cleaning uh, dust and smears, grease and that sort of thing off your lenses and filters. So I would recommend something like that. All right. Our next question is, do you have... Do you have an app and or how do you determine the angle of the sun or when moonrise might be? Uh, you yes. find these times? Yes. So everyone loves apps and uh, I think that a lot of landscape photographers think that they absolutely cannot go out in the wild <laughs> without consulting their apps first. Oh. And so one of the more popular types of app is an app that tells you where the sun is rising and where the sun is setting, when and where the moon is rising and setting, etc. So there's a number of apps out there. I do use an app called The Photographer's Ephemeris, TPP, TPE, TPE, TPE. The Photographer's Ephemeris. Try saying that fast five <laughs> times in a row. I'm not gonna. Okay. <laughs> Uh, so I, I know there's others out there, but I've just been using TPE for a while. It sounds a little bit too much like TP, like toilet paper. Yeah, it so kind of does. You got to emphasize the E, TPE. Uh, so the photographer's ephemeris is actually pretty good at, at giving you all that data, and I do find it useful. Like often when I'm scouting locations, I will use the app to give me a general idea of where the sun's coming up and where it's setting, and I do find this helpful. But I also find that you really don't know what's going to happen with the light until you've actually been there during the sunrise and during the sunset and seen what happens and see how the light interacts with landforms. You know, often it can be difficult. You might know where the sun's coming up and there might be a, a mountain back there somewhere in the distance. And it's hard to know exactly how much the mountain is going to block the light uh, until you actually sit there and witness the light happen. So I do use the apps to facilitate my effort to find interesting compositions, but I don't rely on them to the exclusion of my own experience. All right. Our next question is from Jim who asks, I haven't tried focus stacking yet, but I have done exposure stacking. Is it possible to do both on a shot? Yes, it is absolutely possible to do both on a shot. It just makes things a little bit more complicated. So with focus stacking, you're taking the same shot, the same exposure and the same composition. You're just changing your focus point so that everything from very near to very far in your composition, when blended together, will be nice and sharp. And you have to use a computer program to blend all these together. I use a program called Helicon Focus. Uh, so you can't, for example, do this in Lightroom. Exposure blending, same composition, you're not changing anything except for the exposure values. So you take one, you take one extra shot or maybe two extra shots at different exposures and then you blend them together to get one single exposure with more dynamic range. Now you can do this in Lightroom. You can do exposure blending in Lightroom. So if I'm doing both, what I do is for each focus point, I will take my exposure bracket. So let's say I'm taking three exposures uh, to do my exposure blending. So for each focus point, let's say I've got five different focus points I want for focus stacking. I'll take three exposures, my exposure bracket, at each focus point. So I end up with 15 different photos. What I'll do first in Lightroom is I will blend the three exposures for each focus point. So I end up with five images. What I do is I use the merge to HDR feature in Lightroom. And so I blend the exposures first. And then I have five images that are my focus stack. And then I bring those into Helicon Focus and I focus stack those. So I blend first, 
so that they're all blended identical, and then I focus stack. Of course, you can do it the other way. Uh, you can also uh, focus stack uh, the individual, uh, so you can take all of your exposure brackets and focus stack the ones that match with each other. So the bright exposure, you can focus stack all the bright exposures, focus stack all the middle exposures, and then focus stack all the dark exposures, and then you can blend them together. Just cross your fingers that the focus stack is going to bring it all together. I, I think the first method, the way I do it, is probably the one that makes the most sense. I've never tried the other method. It's theoretically possible, but it sounds to me like there's a better chance of having errors in that process. So the way I've described it, the way that I typically do it, is probably your best bet. But yes, it is possible. I do do it. It is a giant pain in the rear end, but it's possible. All right. <laughs> Good luck with that. Yeah. Our next question is from another Jim who asks, do you find shooting a photo in portrait orientation offers you better depth than shooting mountains in a landscape, or for shooting mountains in a landscape? Well, so it really depends on the composition. I will switch between the portrait or the landscape orientation, vertical versus horizontal, depending on what it is I'm trying to accomplish with my composition. So if I've got a lot of stuff that's really low down on the ground in my foreground, and I want to include all that, and then I've got a big mountain in the background, and I've got lots of big, tall clouds that are lighting up at sunrise or sunset, and I want to get it all in, going vertical sometimes makes that easier than if you go horizontal. So if I want to get it all in from where my feet are to uh, above my head, then usually I'm going vertical. Uh, but I also will adjust depending on what the scene calls for. Sometimes you can't fix a hor you can't really fit a horizontal composition into a vertical shot or vice versa. You can't pound a square peg into a round hole. So if the composition is arrayed more horizontally, I will go with a horizontal composition. If it's arrayed more vertically, I'll go with a vertical composition. So neither of them really gives a feeling of depth more than the other. I think it just really depends on the scene. I shoot what's called for. If I can do both, if a scene will facilitate both portrait or landscape format, I'll try shooting it both ways. But usually more often than not, I find that most compositions will orient themselves a particular way, and I will adjust my camera's orientation to fit what the scene calls for. All right, our next question is from Tom, who asks, do you use graduated neutral density filters? Do you use them with a filter holder or with gaffer tape? Uh, that is a great question, and I love the fact that you worked in gaffer tape into that question. That's, that's kind of a, a random it does reference. does also say gaffer tape all out Tim Fitzharris, which I did not know <laughs> if he would get that reference or not. Ah, well, I, I do know who Tim Fitzharris is. I did not realize he used gaffer tape, but I guess I'm not surprised. Hmm. Uh, it's a, uh, gaffer tape is great. Uh, it's uh, sticky, but not too sticky, so it's useful for uh, holding things up temporarily and then not having sticky residue all over them when you're done. Uh, so I actually don't really use filters that much anymore because I do, for, um, for exposure control, I do exposure blending more often than using graduated neutral density filters. Graduated filters are a real great way of balancing your exposure. It's the old fashioned way of doing HDR, I guess you could say. And what a graduated filter is, is it's a little bit darker. It's a gray filter that's darker on the top and clear on the bottom. And there's a graduated transition between the two. And you use this when you're photographing a really bright sunrise or sunset sky. And you've got landscape features beneath that sky that are in shadow. And there's too much of a range between bright and dark for the camera to handle it all simultaneously. So you use the graduated filter. You pull the dark part of it over the sky, and you bring that transition down to the horizon. And that darkens the sky, that reduces the contrast, and allows the camera to capture detail in the sky and detail in that shadowed landscape below. So you use it to balance the exposure. And they work great. They're really easy to use. I used them for many, many years as a photographer. But now with digital photography, I find that I prefer to do exposure blending because with grad filters, sometimes you can get an unnatural effect, especially that transition area. If you've got mountains or trees that are sticking up, uh, you, when you pull the filter down, that transition area covers those up. So the mountains and the trees end up going really dark. And you've got this uh, brighter uh, shadowed foreground underneath that's not part of that transition area, not covered by that transition area. So it, it's not a perfect solution, the grad filter. And that's the reason why I think a lot of photographers prefer to do exposure blending, because you can avoid those weird transition areas. And overall, if you know what you're doing, you can achieve a much more natural looking blend. 
but you have to know what you're doing. Now, as I said, you can do this in Lightroom where you can automate this merge to HDR feature. You just got to be careful when you're pulling down your highlights and bringing up your shadows. If you do it too aggressively, you get this really unnatural HDR look, this grungy HDR look. When your shadows are brighter than your highlights, that doesn't look right. It looks uncanny. And I think a lot of people, this was briefly a fad where everyone mm -hmm. was doing this HDR stuff, but then people began to think that it looked really uncanny and they didn't like it and the fad kind of went away. Uh, so if you know what you're doing, you're just, you're more careful with it. I actually do a lot of exposure blending using Photoshop, using layers and masks, which is much more complicated, but it allows me to fine tune the blend so that it looks very natural and looks a lot the way that the scene looked to my eyes, which is usually my primary concern. So yes, I have used those filters in the past. Yes, I think they're a really good solution to these high contrast scenes, mm -hmm. but no, I'm not currently using them. There are other solutions that require more expertise, but that ultimately can give you better results. Okay. Our next question is from Joshua who asks, I love using longer lenses in everyday shots, 80 millimeter or longer. Mm -hmm. What's your favorite focal length for night slash landscape photos? Well, so when I'm shooting uh, landscapes and if I'm shooting night photos, I go wide, baby, wide. The wider, the better. I love ultra wide focal lengths. And they're really great for landscape because it allows you to include all of that interesting foreground stuff that helps create depth in your compositions and creates these compelling near far visual juxtapositions that really entice the viewer both visually and emotionally into the composition that you've created. So I'm often working with focal lengths that are mind-bogglingly wide. My favorite lens is probably my 11 to 24 millimeter wide angle zoom. That is on a full frame camera. And so 11 millimeters on a full frame is as wide as you can go. There's nothing out there that's wider. And that's a stunning field of view. Now when I'm doing night photography, it's also important for me to have a lens that brings in a lot of light, so having a fast like f2.8 lens that allows you to use a really big wide open aperture and bring in a lot of light so you can capture those stars, that's really useful. So for example, uh, I've been shooting a lot recently with Tamron's 15 to 30 uh, wide angle zoom, which is an f2.8 lens. And uh, that's really great for night photography. So I love these wider focal lengths. I do occasionally zoom in with uh, the tighter focal lengths for my landscape work. But I would say easily 99.9% .9 of my landscape work, I've been using this 99.9% uh, .9 statistic a lot. But yes, I think it's accurate to say that 99.9% .9 of my landscape work is done with a wide angle lens. All right. Our next question is from Christine, all right, who asks, I'm impressed that in your landscapes, the foreground is as crisp as the background. How do you achieve this? Okay, so this is uh, what I was talking about earlier. This near far compositional style requires a lot of depth of field. So usually you would use a very small aperture to extend your depth of field to cover both near to far. I do a lot of focus stacking now. Uh, so you can do either. Focus stacking obviously requires a little bit more computer expertise to get it to work together. So you could do it the old-fashioned way using hyperfocal distance and depth of field. Hyperfocal distance basically is where you focus the camera to then use depth of field to extend the zone of focus around your focus point to cover everything from near to far. So if you've got a scene where you've got a clump of flowers in your foreground that's three feet away from you, and then you've got a mountain in the background that's a mile away from you. If you focus on the mountain, you focus too far back. When you extend your depth of field, it's going to extend around the mountain and it's not going to cover the flowers in the foreground. If you focus on the flowers, then you've got the same problem in reverse. You extend your depth of field around the flowers, it may not hit the mountain in the background. So the best place to focus is somewhere in between those two extremes. And the easiest way uh, you can choose a focus point, the ideal focus point, is when you're in the field, obviously you're not going to have a lot of precision about where you're going to, you know, that hyperfocal distance might be. So what I do is I just basically estimate the distance from my lens to my closest foreground object. So it's the, let's say it's those flowers that are three feet away. And then I double that distance 
and then I focus on that point. So instead of focusing on the flowers that are three feet away, I focus on a point that is approximately six feet away, and then I, then I drop my aperture, use a smaller aperture, extend my depth of field around that focus point, and that focus point is more or less going to be your ideal hyperfocal distance for extending that depth of field, so that everything from three feet away to that mountain that's in the background are all rendered sharply in focus. Now, if you do focus stacking, you don't have to worry about any of this. All you have to worry about is getting enough shots from near to far so that you can blend them together on the computer later. But you don't have to worry about hyperfocal distance. You don't have to worry about depth of field as much or anything like that. It takes away all of this complicated nonsense. All right. Yes. Yeah, so once again, check out my uh, ebook video course, Focusing for Landscape Photography. It takes all the mystery out of it. It explains in great detail all the things I've just talked about. All right, and it's time for, I have one more question in the chat. Right. So one let's more. answer this last question. It's a longish one. A longish one. This okay. question is from Chrissy who asks, what is the best way to take pictures of a full moon? My max lens is 70 to 300 telephoto. I've got some nice pictures with the moon surrounded by the leaves of trees in the area, but sometimes notice a small greenish circle below the moon and would also like to get a closer picture of the moon. Also, I got one more question while answer, asking that question. So we have one more question after this question. Okay, okay. Well, the moon question is a little bit complicated because it depends on what you want to accomplish with your moonshot. So if you want a, 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 like a tighter, just like a portrait of the moon, you need a longer focal length or you need to take a shot and crop a lot around it. But if you want to do it without cropping, you just need more focal length. So a longer lens, uh, you might also want to add on like a 1.4x converter or something like that to extend your focal length will make the moon look bigger and bigger in the image frame. Now, a few things to consider. So that greenish tinge that you're getting, that, that, that could be many different things. That could be chromatic aberration from your lens, which is a lens imperfection uh, that uh, shows up in high contrast areas. And it usually shows up as a purple or a green fringe. So it could be that. Uh, that could also be an area with it where you're just overexposed. So you want to be very careful with the exposure of your moon. You don't want it to be blown out. You want to be able to see the detail in the moon. So one thing you can do to avoid having an overexposed moon is to use a spot meter function on your camera and just meter from the moon directly. Now the moon is a little bit brighter than uh, what would be considered neutral. Whenever your, your camera meter meters off of something, it's trying to make it look neutral, basically neutral gray. So if you're metering off the moon, you're going to want to adjust your exposure a bit using exposure compensation, maybe give it a plus one or a plus two to make the moon look like it should look without overexposing it. So you want to experiment with this a little bit to make sure you're capturing that detail. So if you avoid the exposure problems, uh, then that might take away that green tinge. Or if you're using a higher quality lens that doesn't have really bad chromatic aberration. And if you have chromatic aberration showing up, you can fix it easily in the raw conversion process. Most raw converters allow you to apply some sort of lens profile that will get rid of the chromatic aberration or just check a box that will automatically get rid of it. Or you might have some sliders that you can use. In, uh, in Lightroom, it's just one click of a box that gets rid of the chromatic aberration. So that's one thing that can help. All right, mm -hmm. and now time for our last question. Okay. Unless someone asks one while I'm reading this question again. Um, how much don't, post- Don't encourage them. <laughs> <laughs> How much post-processing do you do on the majority of your photos? Ah, the post-processing question. I always view this as a trick question. Oh. So I'm going to give you a trick answer. Oh, okay. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not like a big fan of doing post-processing that fundamentally alters the reality of the scene. So there are a lot of folks out there that are showing people techniques like changing the skies or adding color and light that wasn't really there. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't really do any of that stuff. I'm a photographer, so I like to be able to show the scene in a way you know, that, that is close to the photographic reality captured. It doesn't necessarily mean it's got to look exactly the way it looked to the eyes, but it, it's realistic uh, based on the way your, cap, your camera captured it. But then again, I am shooting raw files. Raw files are not intended to be a final product. You do have to add contrast and color uh, to uh, these photos to make them, to optimize them, to make them look good, to really bring things out. And I do embrace a lot of these computer techniques that allow you to accomplish things that you used to be able to accomplish with physical techniques. So exposure blending uh, gets you the same results as using a graduated neutral density filter, which we described earlier. And focus stacking allows you to get 
similar results to what you would do by using small apertures and extending your depth of field or using like a tilt shift lens which allows you to change the plane of focus and get that near far sharpness. These are all things that you could do physically with your camera that you can now also do digitally and you can use the digital technique to optimize the results and just take it a little bit further. So I've got no problem with embracing these techniques to uh, accomplish the same sorts of things I might have in the past accomplished uh, physically or photographically. And also I, you know, I, I recognize the long tradition of photographers like Ansel Adams in the digital, they were, they were doing the physical darkroom. Uh, they were doing a lot of uh, selective adjustments to contrast and you know, localized adjustments, making things brighter or darker. I do embrace those techniques in my digital darkroom. So I'm, I'm doing a lot of the stuff that's within the long tradition of photography, but I'm really not into making Photoshop fantasies. I, I, you know, I've shown you some photos that were near uh, misses. They, they had some decent compositions, but the clouds weren't quite right or the light wasn't quite right, and I'm not really satisfied with those photos. And the answer that I give to that is I go back in the field and work harder and try to wait for the real conditions to line up. My answer never is, well, let's just go into Photoshop and make it look good. <laughs> uh, so I put a huge emphasis on my field technique. I do use digital darkroom techniques to, to help optimize the photos I'm taking. I'm not a complete uh, Luddite. I'm not uh, opposed to uh, using the computer to uh, subtly enhance and optimize your photos, but I don't want to step away from the photographic reality that I actually witnessed with my own eyes. All right. That was our last question. And that was a great trick question with a great <laughs> trick answer at the end. So I want to thank everyone for joining us for this live event. And if you're mm -hmm. watching it later, not live, uh, make sure that you think about joining us for one of the live events because it's always great yeah. to get your thoughts and to get your questions here while we're on the event. We have a, a lot of different people that come in and participate. We seem to have a revolving cast of characters. So <laughs> I encourage uh, more people to come and join us while we're live when you can. And we'll just keep on making these events and hope yeah. that you'll come visit us. Thank you so very much for all of your questions and comments. Thank, uh, thanks also to our sponsor, Tamron, for making this event possible. And with that, I think it's time for me to sign off. I'm Ian Plant. And I'm Lilia Khalif. And thanks for watching. Bye. Bye.